Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Oh, hey there, Calvary. Thanks for tuning in for your word for the day today. Hope you're having a great day. We are continuing the look at the life of Samson, the 12th and final judge in the book of Judges, uh, the person that was supposed to be leading and uh, eventually saving God's people from the hand of the Philistines. And unfortunately, this chapter is a bit of the beginning of the end for our uh, little uh, pseudo hero, Samson. Things have already started to go awry for him and uh, it gets even worse in this chapter. Let's jump right in and take a look at what's going on and uh, maybe what we can learn from it. So Judges chapter 16, verse one says this, now Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here, and they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait until the night of the morning and we'll kill him. But Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he arose and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that's in Hebron. He's like, I'll just carry the fence. It's fine. You're going to lock me in? I'll just carry the whole thing. Now it says after this, verse four, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Not like the pop song from the early 2000s though. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to humble him. And we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you may be bound that one could subdue you. Now, I want to get into kind of what happens next, but first off, this guy has terrible taste in women and finds himself in terrible situations in life because he is, I won't say dating because he's not dating, interacting with women in a way that is not at all what God desires of him. If he simply chose better, his, his life may have gone a little better. But we've already established in previous episodes, there's a trend in the life of Samson that he's seeking to do what's right in his own eyes not what's right in the sight of the Lord. So we've got this new lady in town in the life of, of Samson named Delilah. She's taken a pretty hefty bribe to get some intel on why Samson is so strong. So here's, here's an interesting sequence of events. So she goes to Samson and says, hey, tell me why you're so strong. What could happen that, that someone might subdue you? And he tells her, well, if you take seven fresh bowstrings of you know, bow and arrow bowstrings and tie me up, I'll be like any other man, I'll be weak. So what's Delilah do? But she gets seven fresh bowstrings from the Philistine army and ties him up and sets an ambush. And she says, oh, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he gets up, he breaks the bowstrings and uh, overpowers them all. And so she throws a little pity party. She's like, Samson, you lied to me. What, what really could do it? And he tells her at that point that, oh, hey, if you bind me with new ropes, they've never been used for anything else, that will make me as weak as any other man. And the pattern continues. She gets the Philistine army set up. She ties him presumably while he's sleeping and says, oh, Samson, the Philistines are here. He gets up, breaks the ropes, overpowers them. A third time, these people don't learn. A third time, she goes, Samson, why have you lied to me? Why have you mocked me? What could it be to make you weak? And he says, well, if you take my hair, and here's what's interesting. He starts to really flirt with truth here and starts to really push the boundary. He says, if you take my hair, take seven locks of hair and weave it together and you put a pin in it and do these things, I'll be like any other man. I'll be weak and won't be able to fight. I'm curious at this point how long Samson's hair is like. He's had to have a lot of hair. He's never had a haircut his whole life. Uh, part of his Nazarite vow is to not do that. So she does this while he's sleeping. He wakes up and again, there's lying in wait, an ambush of Philistine soldiers. He rips the thing out of his seven locks of hair and goes and defeats them. Then this happens. Delilah's kind of had it at this point. She said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? I'm not sure that that's what it was to start with, but you've mocked me these three times and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him and his soul was vexed to death. She was good at nagging, apparently, vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and he said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. Now this is interesting. There's three parts to this Nazarite vow. He only mentions one because no, he knows he's broken the other two. In previous chapter, we've seen those. 
If my head is shaved, my strength will leave me and I shall become weak like any other man. Similar story, except this time he's told the truth. He got close last time. This time he tells the truth. He fully gives in to the temptation. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines saying, come up again, for this time he's told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought her money in her hands and she made him sleep on her knees. She called a man and had him shave the seven locks of his head and he began to torment him and his strength had left him. And she said, the, the, the Philistines are upon you, Samson, for the fourth time. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as all the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, again, I told you this is the beginning of the downfall for Samson. There's one more uh, kind of grand finale in, in his life. You'll want to come back tomorrow for that. But what's so interesting is the downfall of Samson, uh, of his, his willingness to flirt with temptation, to do what was right in his own eyes. And really, even as you see the, the, this, this coercion from Delilah, her seeking to earn this bribe and get the truth about him, it, it progresses and he's telling blatant lies about, oh no, it's my hands, it's the bowstrings, it's the rope, until he starts talking about the hair and finally gives it all. Now, let me ask you, where are you, you flirting with temptation to sin today? Where are you going right up against that line? Where are you going, oh, I, I, can, I can get closest. I can just dabble a little bit. I can, I can contain myself. I'm just going to go a little bit closer. Because what we see with, with Samson is he, throughout his whole life, was willing to go just a little bit closer to sin and rebellion. He was willing to, to ignore the Nazarite vow to not touch a dead body. We can assume from the, the events described at his wedding feast that he had broken the, the Nazarite commandment not to drink wine just from the pretense. And, and he was willing to push up against those things. Even in this chapter, willing to push up against the temptation to break this final vow until he did. And really at the end of the day, it's not because his hair had been cut that he lost all his strength. This isn't a Marvel movie where he's got some, you know, super strength from, you know, some bioengineered event. But we get the truth there where it says the Lord left him. God had had enough of Samson's arrogance, enough of his pride thinking that he could do whatever he wanted. And he said, okay, Samson, you go reap the benefits of this. You go reap the consequences of your sin and rebellion and disobedience. And he did. And as this section of chapter 16 closes, this person who maybe he was supposed to save the people from the Philistines from before he was born. This was the plan. But when we live pushing the envelope, pushing the edge of sin and temptation, this is where our life ends up. I heard an analogy as a teenager talking about this of, hey, where, where, how should we navigate that line of what's sin and what's not? And the analogy was that if, if you, you were near a structure fire, a building, or a house was on fire, the question isn't how close to the fire should I get, but the question should be how far away do I need to be to be safe? We should have the same mentality when it comes to sin in my life. Not how close can I get to this indulgent behavior without it being sin, how far away can I be to honor God? So today, let me ask you, are you doing everything, giving as much as you possibly can to honor and follow and obey Jesus? Or are you trying to do the bare minimum and get as close as you can to sin and indulgent behavior? Because you can only walk that line for so long before your light starts to unravel, just like it did for Samson. We don't want that for you. We want you to walk in the richness and fullness and beauty of the life that God has for you. And the way that we do that is saying, I'm going to give as much as I can to honoring and obeying Jesus in every area of my life. And when we do that, things go so much better for us. So let me ask you, where are you pushing the envelope of sin? Where are you flirting with temptation? And what can you do to, do, to back away from that and not end up like Samson? We'll see you tomorrow for the conclusion of Samson's story. And there's a little bit of hope at the end. We'll see you tomorrow.